We are live, we are live, and I'm coming at you with five. Welcome to another edition of G Group 2786 on my channel here. Gavin Richard presents. I hope all is well, whoever you are, wherever you are, that you are enjoying this Saturday indoors. Because, uh, of course, we have every state practically, at least with the exception of eight states remaining, have stay at home orders. Um, hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, with all of this stuff with the coronavirus, that you guys are safe. Uh, and try to make this a productive day. I know that it's hard uh, not being able to go places with movies, theaters being shut down, restaurants being closed. Uh, it's not easy. It's certainly different. But, you know, I'm using this day to be productive. You know, I have some entrepreneurial ideas that I'm working on. I'm actually working on a couple of books that I've been writing. Uh, just trying to fight writer's block with it and hopefully it will be ready uh, before the end of this year. I'm pushing for the fall for the release of some things. And, you know, uh, with all of this going on, I want to know, and I'm just trying to see if I can set up a poll. What are you guys, if you put in your comments, what are you guys doing during this coronavirus period? Are you working remotely from home? If not, have you thought of even creating a business for yourself? Uh, those are things that you know, something we can do, and that's probably something I'll share on my YouTube channel, uh, which will be free for everyone, about uh, the corona, about um, coronavirus entrepreneurship. Because now, people, for instance, who, uh, let's say, for example, there is a demand, of course, for hand sanitizers. There are people who are in the chemistry industry that uh, thought of doing this, never had an opportunity to do it, and let's say you're a pharmacist, now that you know, now that you know what you know about this virus, and the CDC is talking about wearing masks, for instance, and using hand sanitizers, those things are now needed, and this is a way for our community, especially black people, we can uh, get a real establish not just a business, but a business relationship. Because it's just two parts, it's a business and it's a relationship as well with the community. And people will come back to you when you have a relationship with them. Uh, they will remember the good work you did. That's kind of how I function as an attorney when I've done cases and handled personal injury settlements or even criminal cases. Someone will call me and say, hey, you were my attorney for this and I need you to do this family law case now. Uh, for my friend who's looking for a lawyer, I recommended you. I wanted you to do this will to type this testament up. So those are things that happen. Now, I this video for today, if you guys saw my promo on YouTube, and some of you probably and those that did not see it, uh, today we are connect, talking about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, of course, this is April 4th, 2020. Um, April 4th, 1968 marks the 52nd, uh, it was 52 years ago. So 52 years ago at about 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered outside the Lorraine Motel on the third floor balcony outside his room 303. Um, he was actually there talking to family, I'm sorry, not family, but people in the courtyard, uh, which included Jesse Jackson and Andy Young were there, also several others, and on a shot rang out, and on the balcony uh, was Billy Samuel, Samuel Billy Kyles, Reverend Billy Kyles, there was also uh, his brother, um, it was A.D. King, was present as well, um, and they all witnessed this a horrific event that changed really the face of black America because I don't think that since Dr. King's assassination we have truly recovered uh, from it and I feel our black leadership uh, which was once solid where we had just think for example that in the 1960s all of these prominent forgetting even black leaders prominent Leaders like John F. Kennedy, uh, Medgar Evers, Martin, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Bobby Kennedy, all got assassinated between the years 1963 to 1968, five, within five years. 
And when it comes to black America, and especially the times that we are in now, where we are being, of course, having stay-at-home orders in different states, when we're faced with the possibility of martial law, 52 years ago today, after Dr. King's assassination, you had riots practically in every major city across this country. Uh, in New Orleans in particular, there was rioting here. My uh, grandfather and my mom were telling me when they were in the war in that war, how they actually had to put black flags up or black sheets up so that they know when the people would come along, the people would arrive, they knew not to touch those homes because there were blacks in it. Now, of course, if you lived in a neighborhood like the Lower Night Ward, it was predominantly black, so they all knew who, who to mess with and who not to. Anyway, but that was a thing that happened. And all across, you know, the country from Chicago to Washington, D.C., New York, all um, people were just rioting upset over what happened with Dr. King. And oddly enough, when I interviewed our late brother, the late great Dick Gregory, I interviewed him on that on April 4th, 2007. And he called me on the phone and I turned the recorder on. And I still have that recording. I might have to upload it for you guys to listen to. Uh, it's just something I should do. I just gotta find. I have it somewhere. But as soon as I started with those dates, the regular was like, oh, "How can I forget that date? How can I not forget?" And I asked him where he was. He told me he was in California. He heard the broadcast over the radio. He said that this told him, or this announced on the radio, Dr. King assassinated by a white man in Memphis, Tennessee, by a sniper's rifle. Now, who knew this was a white man? It was one of the things Dick said. How did they know all this stuff? How did the press get that? Could be assumptions, that's my guess, but could have been something more sinister. Well, as in, Dick Gregory uh, was a close friend of Dr. King and Malcolm X. Uh, you know, you know the story of Dick Gregory, he was very, um, at the height of his career, as a comedian, he gave that up for the cause of injustice and against racism against black people in this country. And really, if it was an injustice against any group of people, he stood up for it. He humanized all peoples. But in particular, his concern was for the African American community, black people in this country. So uh, he is well missed now. Uh, it's been years since his death, but it's still hard to believe that he's gone, but, you know, he lived a dynamic life. Nevertheless, uh, getting back to our subject, Dick and Mark Lane, who was an attorney, they wrote a book called Codename Zorro. Uh, Mark Lane also wrote a book called Rush to Judgment that he did on Kennedy assassination. Uh, Mark Lane was an, was an attorney who was uh, actually was one of the few that defended Lee Harvey Oswald after his assassination because he cast doubt and didn't believe that Kennedy was assassinated by this long gunman. Now, how it relates to Dr. King, that's our, that's our subject matter. What you guys, would, I would like for you to do is go home or go on Amazon after this and look up two books called, <coughs> one is called An Active State by Dr. William Pepper. That's his actual name, Dr. Pepper. And William Pepper wrote the book An Active State. Pepper was the attorney, the final attorney for James L. Ray. Uh, and James Earl Ray, of course, is the alleged assassin in the Dr. King shooting. But if you read the book Act of State, as well as get the book by Jim DiEugenio, it's called The Assassinations, where they broke down all four assassinations, major assassinations, including John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Dr. King, and Bobby Kennedy. You'll understand 
the history and the facts and the habitual, the hatred that was in this, not only in this country, but by forces in government, certain forces that did not like these men. And mainly because at that time there was a Vietnam War going on and gearing up and there was a lot of money to be made and these men who were very powerful and had a platform were in positions to derail that. And just read those books and you'll see uh, what happened with Dr. King. In particular, uh, we're focusing on Dr. King now. Um, the official government position, as many of you know, is that Dr. King was this great civil rights leader who was killed outside the, at the Lorraine Motel on April 4, 1968 from a sniper shot in the boarding room house across the street. The official government position is that James Earl Ray took a 38, 380 Remington sniper rifle in the bathroom of a boarding house where there are multiple people that come in and out of there and fired one shot hitting Dr. King in the chin, which went through his mouth, knocked the back uh, teeth out, came out his body, clipped the carotid artery, also clipped his tie, then it went into the, ch uh, the chest and ended up underneath the shoulder blade within the skin. And that's the official government position. Yet, some 30 years later, after Dr. King's assassination, most people don't even know that there was a trial in Memphis. And this was a civil trial. Uh, involving Lloyd Jowers versus the King family, or I should say the King family versus Lloyd Jowers. Now, 30 years after Dr. King's death, and there's video of this, James Earl Ray is seen shaking hands with Dexter King. Uh, and Dexter King basically said he did not believe James Earl Ray murdered his father. And there's some credence to back that up that James Earl Ray did not kill Dr. King. Uh, a good friend of mine and a brother to the show, uh, Judge Joe Brown. Those that know Judge Joe Brown, shout out to him. Uh, judge Joe Brown was actually uh, the judge that heard James Earl Ray's final appeal. He was actually in that division. And had he had a chance to make a ruling, uh, Judge Joe Brown was kicked off the case uh, short, right around the time James Earl Ray died. But he made it clear that had James Earl Ray lived and not died, and had James Earl Ray's attorney at the time, who also died, which was interesting, he would have concluded that James Earl Ray was not the gunman uh, to kill Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, by his accounts, uh, from Judge Joe Brown's investigation, he stated that Dr. King was killed by a two-man hit team uh, that was shooting from the slop, not from the ground up, although what we do from the ground up, and I'll explain that in a minute, but they were shooting from the slop house across the street uh, with a special military-grade weapon. From his investigation, he also concluded that the rifle that is in the National Civil Rights Museum, that they concluded killed a 38 of 6, that they concluded killed Dr. King, or did not in fact match with the bullets that were pulled out of uh, Dr. King. Uh, they did not match. And he even said that these were military style uh, weapons. He, and Judge Joe Brown knows his weapons. Uh, he can tell from the rape of firing, that it, uh, the rate of firing, the type of gun that was used, what was manufactured at that time, where it came from. And we'll have to have him come on the show explain that. But again, but clearly he stated that uh, the weapons that were used were military grade. And from all intents and purposes, even William Pepper in his book, he mentioned specifically how uh, the military was involved. Now, around the time he was coming out with these books, he had named some individuals who I can't get the name of them at that time, 
but I distinctly remember watching this, and he ended up having egg on his face because those men were still alive, and apparently what he was saying, did uh, his career got real virtually, because while he was correct, he gave the, he had the wrong information, and he implicated two gentlemen, um, and I'll have to do a follow-up for you guys uh, talking about this, but uh, he implicated these two gentlemen, and I believe he was threatened with a defamation lawsuit as a result of it because he implicated these men uh, in the assassination of Dr. King. And of course, nobody wants to be labeled a murderer if they didn't do it. But what is clear is that James O. Ray did not do this. Uh, it is clear that James O. Ray was innocent of this crime, or at the bare minimum, he may have been involved in a way where he was a scapegoat, as what Judge Joe Brown said. He stated that Ray was a part of some other scapegoats that were uh, involved in this. And when you read it, I don't know what to really believe, whether it's true or not. But I do believe that it, there certainly was a conspiracy to murder Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What was also disturbing, uh, and of course, Judge Joe Brown got kicked off this case, and it was this case, though, this is how everything has a blessing. As a result of the work he did on that case, he caught the attention of some television producers out of Australia, and they approached him to do a daytime talk show, which, of course, ended up being the Judge Joe Brown TV show, and it, it airs in syndication. Uh, now, I think it was the wrong, at one point, he was the first African-American judge. He had the highest uh, rated judge program, daytime talk show program at that time, one of them at least. And he was even beating uh, Judge Judy in the ratings with some of them. So, uh, yeah, so that's how Judge Joe Brown... Uh, came into the national spotlight. But as it ties to Dr. King, also very interesting when it came to his death was that, number one, most people don't even know this, that he was not supposed to be staying at the Lorraine Motel. Uh, an FBI, he was coming in town for the garbage, garbage strike workers. He actually left uh, Memphis and they had called him back in because there was a double strike going on, and as a result of it, he came back. He was getting ready to do what was called the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, if you look at some of the video clips that they have on Dr. King, Dr. King was actually becoming more militant, you could say. He's, you know, if you listen to those audio tapes, he sounded like Malcolm X from the early 60s. Uh, the things he was advocating for about... He talked about coming to get our check. He advocated for reparations and against the uh, mantra of pull up by your bootstraps. He said, you can't pull up by your bootstraps if you laid us out here and told a Negro you can't wear shoes uh, and made laws because of it. When he doesn't have anything, how can you say pull up by my bootstraps? You know, he also another issue was that there were some uh, informants that were involved in there. Uh, if you've seen the famous photograph of Dr. King laying on the balcony of the Ray Motel, and his head is being propped up, and there's a young man pointing in the direction where the shot came from. And of course, you see the famous picture of Jesse Jackson and Andy Young, and I can't think of the other gentleman, they're pointing in that same direction. This man is pointing, telling him to point in that direction. And this gentleman's name uh, escapes me now, but he can't, it came out that he was a uh, informant for the Central Intelligence Agency. I think his name, I, wanna, I don't want to give him the wrong name. Uh, I think it's Merrill McCullough if I'm not mistaken. Hold a second. I'm going to verify this because when I do these videos, guys, and I'm just thinking off the, talking off the top of my head, I'm going from memory. And 
I think it is Meryl McCullough. Yeah, it is Merrill McCullough. Now, he works, yeah, he worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. I believe he was part of a group, and this all came up at the trial, too. Uh, he was part of a group, uh, infiltrated group called the Invaders that were there at the Lorraine Motel. And he obviously is pointing in direction where they say the shot came from. When in actuality, the shot came from the bottom of the Lorraine, uh, bottom floor, across either from the slop house or in the bushes. And our brother Ron Hurt actually had an opportunity to call Merrill McCullough, and Merrill McCullough would not even answer some questions. And the only thing he would acknowledge was he was uh, there at the Lorraine Motel. That was him in the photograph. Uh, he would not talk further with. I heard. And I'm looking at it here. Very interesting. This is on the Oprah Winfrey website. His daughter apparently wrote a article about her family secret to keep governments in face, so she willingly kept herself in the dark. Her name is Lita McCullough Seletsky. And apparently, I don't know if Marilyn McCullough is still alive. I'm assuming he's passed. Let's see. And she's an attorney. Okay, very interesting. So, I might have to post this link for you guys. It's a lot to read. But Meryl McCullough was there. And, you know, Dick Gregory even talked about him, how he was so secret uh, involved in from information that he gathered from the Freedom of Information Act that he was so undercover that he actually got his informant check, not from the government, but actually from uh, the utility company, uh, which was very interesting. Uh, and uh, the other th and two, not just Marilyn McCullough, but Reverend Billy Cows, who I mentioned earlier. I told you to keep his name in mind. Well, Billy Cows supposedly, uh, and he died sometime, I believe, in 2017. Uh, Reverend Billy Cows uh, was an informant for the Memphis Police Department, by all accounts. This has been said by Dick Gregory, this has been said by Judge Joe Brown, uh, Steve Coakley. Of course, it's done stuff on him and Jesse Jackson that I'm going to touch on in a minute. But uh, this, yeah, Samuel Billy Cowles, according to him, he was in room 303 with Abernathy King and, and uh, himself. And he still claims they just talked about preacher talk. Well, Billy Cowles was called as a witness in a civil trial. Now, there was an audio clip, a video clip of Billy Cowles describing what happened on that balcony. Now, what was interesting in what Cowles said is as he's talking and he's giving this speech about how we talk preacher talk, and he said this and this and that. He was talking, and he talked about how Dr. King was talking to people in the courtyard. He says, he stood here and I stood there, only as I moved away, so he could have a clear shot. The shot rang out. Let me say that one more time. He said, only as I move away, so he could have a clear shot. The shot rang out. And that clip was played in front of the jury, and Pepper details that in the book. 
and how the whole audience gasped when they heard that. Now, Kyle's in his defense, he assumed that James Earl Ray was probably there, didn't know that he had a shot and shot him, but to many other people, they didn't believe that. A lot of us didn't believe that what he was saying and thought, yeah, he had something to do with Dr. King's assassination, especially given from the information that's come out now that he was a police informant and how the Memphis Police Department was involved in uh, Dr. King's assassination as well from the removal of, and this is another aspect, Dr. King had bodyguards that were there to watch him from the black firefighters. I believe a uh, gentleman's name was James Reddit. Uh, he was actually forcibly removed from the uh, watch house that we're talking about that we said Dr. King was, a, that Dr. King supposedly was shot at, shot at. He was ordered by his superiors and he was removed by force from leaving, for leaving that post. He was removed by force. So that's another red flag. As it relates to Jesse Jackson, I have to say this in fairness. Um, I'm going to do, tell you some things that I've read in the book, things that I've heard. There's been rumors that, of course, that Jesse was involved in Dr. King's murder. Um, you know, I did see video clips of Steve Coakley, his analysis on the assassination. I did see the video where Andy Young talked about how Dr. King was assassinated, that Jesse Jackson actually put his Dr. King's blood on his shirt. Uh, I know supposedly he cradled Dr. King in his hands. Uh, and that wasn't even true. From my understanding, Ralph Abernathy was there. Trump was the only one that was close, that got up close to Dr. King enough that cradled him. But was in the ambulance when Dr. King was in the, uh, was being taken to the emergency room. Uh, he was the only one there. Another interesting thing I'm bringing up before I get back to Jesse Jackson is that when it comes to the emergency room uh, visit, I heard from, uh, or I saw from Brother Ron talked about this, as well as with Johnson, I don't know how true, but did you guys hear that uh, Dr. King had actually survived the shooting and uh, apparently, and I think Pepper, it's not in the active state book, but I think Pepper did a follow-up where the nurses and doctors supposedly that were there to save Dr. King's life kicked uh, Andy Young and Dr. King's brother and Ralph out of the room and they smothered Dr. King while he was still breathing and spat on him. I've heard that too. You know, it, there's a lot. And of course, I don't know how true that is. Uh, there's no evidence of that. But would it surprise me if something like that happened? No, it wouldn't. Uh, it was highly unlikely though that Dr. King could have survived uh, a shot like that. Uh, even from Judge Joe Brown, his expertise, he said he doubted it because Dr. King's carotid artery, artery was clipped by this high-velocity weapon. So there was no way Dr. King would have survived that shot, even if he was standing right outside the emergency room three seconds after he was shot. Uh, that's how much blood he lost. Getting back to Jesse Jackson... A lot. Of, uh, there was also a gag order where they said they weren't going to talk to the press, but then Jesse Jackson immediately gives a statement to the press, and of course his career took off right after Dr. King's assassination. Now I've met Jesse Jackson uh, very briefly. Uh, he was nice to me. Uh, I don't know how true any of that is. Judge Joe Brown denies. Jesse Jackson had anything to do with it from my conversations with him and listening to interviews. Uh, he said Jesse didn't have a damn thing to do with it. He said Jesse was the one that was pushing that we come up with anything, any invest with the investigation of Dr. King's murder. Um, he said Billy Kyle's was different. So uh, he was a different story. He obviously says that uh, Billy Kyle's was involved in it. Uh, in some way, 
shape or form that he was there because Dr. King was actually supposed to go to Billy Kyle's house for dinner with the rest of the pastors and it kept getting pushed back the time and even uh, from what Judge Joe Brown said he said that uh, Kyle's wife even kept calling from a statement that I think she gave and kept saying, you know, it's getting cold. The food's getting cold now. It was getting close. And obviously, if you're going to do an assassination, uh, you would not, they wouldn't have assassinated him after 7 o'clock because it was, by that time, it would be too dark. But 6 o'clock, where the sun is about to go down, he had to be taken out uh, rather quickly. The other thing, uh, so with regards to Jesse, you know, I don't know how true that would be. Do I think Jesse Jackson is an opportunist? Uh, yeah, I think he was. Does that prove he was actively involved in his murder? You know, I've seen Steve Coker's analysis where he's saying he actually, I think, saying that Jesse was shot from below by it. It's, he implied that Jesse Jackson shot Dr. King from below it. I couldn't fathom that with all of those witnesses right there. Uh, you know, anything like that happened. And even Pepper hints that to that in his book. So if you take Pepper's book and read it, it's very damning on Jesse Jackson's part and on Billy Kyle's part. Now, of course, even if these men were involved in it, they were not the masterminds. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover could not stand Dr. King. And without question, and without a doubt, I believe he certainly had something to do with King's murder. Um, they named in the verdict when Lord Jowers, they ruled against the jurors, which was made up of six blacks and six whites. They ruled in favor of the King family and awarded them $100. The trial was not about money. It was about the truth, because at that time, even the feds would not reopen Dr. King's murder. Janet Reno said they weren't going to reopen the, uh, the murder case. Uh, the state of Tennessee, of Tennessee, obviously wasn't going to uh, obviously reopen it. The DA's office in Memphis wasn't interested in reopening it. Reopening it, but how now? But um. The jury found in favor of King, ruled against Lloyd Jowers, but also named J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, Richard Helms and the CIA, and other co-conspirators as uh, the defendants in this case. And so, now of course, starting, let's rewind, how did Lloyd Jowers get involved in this? Who is Lloyd Jowers? You guys might ask. Lloyd Jowers was the owner of a barbecue place called Jim's Bar and Grill. And he went on ABC News with Sam Donaldson, I believe, and stated that he had been involved in an assassination plot to kill Dr. Martin Luther King. And he stated who the shooter was, that it was a Memphis police lieutenant by the name of Earl Clark, that he uh, basically said that he shot Dr. King from outside the restaurant, uh, on the hill, on the bushes, which were cleared the very next day. Now, this little grassy knoll area that was right in front of the Lorraine Motel would have been perfect for a sniper to shoot at. But the next day, those bushes were cleared, and there's actually a border that still exists that was presented uh, for the uh, jury, and in Pepper's book, he talks about it, as well as Judge Joe Brown, he has talked about it. It was in order to clear all bushes in, in that area. Uh, the eyewitness, there was eyewitnesses who actually saw a man jump into a police cruiser after the shooting. It was a taxi driver named Phillips. This taxi driver who saw this died not too long ago after... Dr. King's assassination. I think within hours he was murdered. So, 
as it relates to getting back to Lloyd Jowers. And I'm just giving you guys different stuff. Jowers uh, stated that he was contracted by the Mafia Kingpin by the name of Frank Roberto to put a contract on Dr. King. And they would supply the weaponry and the restaurant was supposed to be the cover or back front for all of this happening. So, Earl Clark was a sharpshooter for the Memphis Police Department. His wife even testified on his behalf, denying that he had anything to do with Dr. King that he found on the drain wheel. And from what his wife said, she said that her husband couldn't have, it, couldn't have done it because he was headed to the cleaners around that time. And one of the things that Gregory pointed out that happened at the trial was that well, Mrs. Clark you said your husband was headed to the cleaners then, right? Yeah. And you said he was on duty that day? And she said, well, yeah, later that night. Ma'am, did you know that the cleaners closes at 5 o'clock that afternoon? Okay. Not 6. And she changed the story, saying, well, he was home when it happened, and so forth. In other words, there was nothing. She did not have a strong alibi to attest to where her husband's whereabouts were at the time Dr. King was murdered. So, I've given you guys a boatload of stuff that I just can think of off the top of my head. And I'm going to put the link up that I saw about Meryl McCullough because it's actually a good read. This is my first time just looking at it. Uh, excuse me a second, guys. It was very deep. Uh, the other thing, too, very important was when I mentioned Dr. King was not supposed to be staying at the Lorraine Motel, he was actually staying at, I believe, at a white hotel in Memphis, and a radio ad was put out stating, uh, what is a Negro pastor staying in a white hotel for? And it was as a result of this that Dr. King went to the Lorraine Motel. So in other words, sadly, he booked his own assassination. Now, he was not even supposed to be staying in room 303. Someone from his entourage supposedly had moved the uh, date, the uh, rooms, getting them switched from the uh, ground up to the balcony. Now, you don't stand on a balcony, obviously, because you would be open the sniper uh, fire. Obviously, you would want to sleep on a lower level where you wouldn't be visible to a sniper, but Dr. King probably just didn't even think of that. And truth be told, sorry, I got a little winded. Dr. King knew that his time on Earth was up. He even told his wife, Coretta Scott King, after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, that they were going to get me next. And there's a boatload of information you guys can look at uh, in those two books that will tell you everything I just was paraphrasing from memory that I read because, uh, you know, this was obviously uh, a crucial moment in history, a life-changing moment uh, that changed our nation, that changed the world for that matter. And... We should be concerned about what happened because if someone can take out someone like that and get away with it and then tell a lie for the next 50 years that it was James L. Wade, it was James L. Wade, knowing that it wasn't, then what, then what else are they lying about? Why so much secrecy? You know, who are these people that killed Martin Luther King Jr.? You have to ask that. Dr. King is someone that we have a national holiday named after. 
So we should get to the bottom of what happened to her for the sake of his family. And we can't obviously have murderers running around. Although most, more than likely, these men are dead. I want Earl Falk is deceased. I know uh, Eddie Cobb is mistaken as dead. I believe Meryl McCullough is deceased. I'm not sure. Hold on, guys. I don't want to. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I'm trying to be very careful with my words here. So, reading from here, uh, his daughter talks about, Meryl McCullough's daughter talks about how in February 1968, a mere two months after he graduated from the police academy, the sanitation strike began. The police department grew concerned that the radical invaders might orchestrate acts of mayhem. Asked my father to invade with the group. They were staying at the Lorraine while assisting with King's upcoming march, and Dad duly reported their activities to the Memphis PD's intelligence division. Now, my role was to collect information and to detect any plans for life threatening criminal activity. Dad wrote. Two months later, King was dead. Further reads, and I'm, of course, I'm picking through this. You guys can look at it. He said, when Dad and I started talking about the assassination, his tone turned sorrowful. He didn't cry that day. He said, numb by shock, he, he locked into his professional duties. But a week earlier, when National Guard troops flooded the street following King's first chaotic Memphis march, he'd been able to come. I felt that, like those tanks were there to occupy the African American community. He said, it did not matter that I was a police officer. They would have turned that 50 caliber machine gun on me. In my experience, soldiers, police officers, and CIA officers perform out of a sense of duty rather than how they feel about an assignment. How did I feel? I felt oppressed. She finally asked him, What do you think? What I spent, what I had spent, Decades wonder, do you think James O. Ray acted alone, or do you think the government saw Dr. King as a threat to national security and targeted him? After an all, an FBI memo had called King the most dangerous Negro in the nation. Dad sighed, I always believed that the United States government wouldn't assassinate its own citizens. He said, I still believe that. I understood, I give one to trust, even when the Oxfony of voices tells you maybe you shouldn't because sometimes stronger forces prevail. Okay, so I apologize. From looking at this, it looks like he's still alive. Okay, so he is still alive from all intents and purposes. I don't want to say uh, I did not want to say falsely that 
uh, this damage there. So I'm glad I was wrong and corrected it. The other thing, too, is another person that was there was Hosea Williams, was also at the Lorraine Motel with Dr. King. Uh, Hosea was basically Dr. King's enforcer, and, uh, and uh, he was angry, obviously, at the assassination to the point where he even said he wished he could uh, have, take all the molecules in the air, make a machine gun, and kill him some white people. Uh, he stated that. Now, and he was even, apparently, from all accounts, he was mad with Jesse Jackson over uh, talking to the press. Now, I don't know how truthful, again, that part is, whether he was involved or not, that has been into question. Um, the other th aspect of it is, it, what is true is that uh, Dr. King clearly was killed in a conspiracy. Uh, the Cointel profiles that we know that were released by, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act on J. Edgar Hoover. The 1976 House Select Assassination Committee's investigation uh, that concluded that Kennedy and King, talking about President John F. Kennedy and Dr. King, were more than likely killed in the result of a conspiracy, although they would not exonerate the two long government. And one of the things I find very interesting about these long is that they have some unique names, don't they? Uh, James L. Ray is a first person name. Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, you know, Sirhan. Sirhan. He's the one that shot RFK, Robert uh, F. Kennedy. I think that's very interesting. Uh, you know, I think that, um, well, that's just one observation. I at any rate, you guys know from this information, you take this uh, how you see it, but do research because it's important to know history, not because you want to study names and dates, but because the mistakes of the past are not repeated. That's why we study history. That's why history is one of my favorite classes I took as a kid, because we learn about important people and what we can do that was different that we may be better as a society. So those things are important. Uh, but And it tells a lot about ourselves, too, if we know the truth and history of this country. Because as great as America is, and as great as our country can be where someone can come from nothing and make something out of themselves, I believe America can do that. This also, country also has a dark history as it relates to race and how it has treated black Americans. So with that being said, guys, I'm going to take a break. I'm getting tired. But thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this was a long video. There will be more to come here on Patreon. I'm Gavin Richard. This is Gavin Richard Presents. Please check out those books. Uh, really check out the books entitled Act of State and Assassinations, respectively by Dr. William F. Pepper and James D. Eugenio. I'm out, you guys. Be safe. I'm falling asleep. But uh, you guys be safe and be blessed today, okay? And also, please uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube channel, GB2786, for more videos. Uh, and also donate uh, Cash App to PayPal, uh, Gavin Richard, Esquire, uh, all that description will be in the video. Thanks, guys. Peace.